Welcome back to Just Giants with Grump and the Cranky Fan, the best damn podcast for the best damn football team. I am your host, the Football Grump. With me, as always, is Mike the Cranky Fan, and it is a snowy Monday night. It is a snowy Monday night, Grump, and we are happy for a lot of reasons. Our New York Knicks have won six in a row. I just got back from the Garden. They beat Boston. Uh, Grump, congratulations to Grump. He is now an uncle again. Big, big news. Exciting. My first nephew was a Joe, and my latest nephew is a Joe. That is (laughs) bizarre, (laughs) right? (laughs) Hopefully this Joe will be a future Giant fan, and when he's hosting Just Giants, the next generation... We will guest star in our 80s and 90s. So well, congratulations to you, Grump. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have one sister that married into a defective san- uh, family. Um, oh, I have two. I have two sisters that married into uh, defect families of uh, Jets fan base. But this sister, the one I am, I guess, uh, closest to in age, yeah. um, you know, walked the true path. So I have, I have, yeah, I have fair confidence here. In fact, in fact, um, I guess it's weird to say this, but her husband's, so my brother-in-law's brother, I guess is not really a brother-in-law, but, Mm -hmm. um, has the tickets right in front of us. Oddly, super weird. Like not planned that, that just happened. There's only 80,000 people in in the Meadowlands. You'd think, you know. Yeah, so what technically, technically yeah. I sit with family, and right in front of me is more family. So that's right. Yeah. Um, and that's in other news, I mean, you, you, the the Knicks on fire, the Devils completing their trade. Um, yeah, they're on. They just smacked the shit out of the Flyers. By the way, I have, I know the memes been shared about how Philly has lost like three championships this year, <laughs> in in all of sports. I really hope that this is just like. A cascade of failures for that city. Well, actually, we could say four because they lost in the uh, semifinals, the MLS Cup last. Um, last they year, lost. So. They lost the USFL game. That's right. They lost the USFL championship to Birmingham. And Villanova sucks, I think, too. <laughs> although, although the Knicks will be thankful for Jalen Brunson and Josh Hart, but they're no longer playing for Villanova, so fuck them. <laughs> Pile it on the the Philly failures. Yeah, the Devils smacked the shit out of them. It was something like seven nothing by the end of that game. Yeah, I will be down in Philly on Wednesday for work, and I will come out of 30th Street Station with double barrels, baby. <laughs> double bullets to all of you cheesesteaks. Um, yeah, so it was a nice weekend. It's a nice snowy night, which we haven't gotten a lot of this year. I'm my, yeah. I'm lucky the uh, Grump Studios faces right out a window. So I'm, Yeah, I'm looking out my window as well, and it's I, I see some white coming down. It's pretty nice. Yeah. Um, and this weekend, we, is, we we're on the precipice of our draft stuff. So this weekend is the combine. The completion of the combine is usually the marker for our start of mm-hmm. our draft coverage, I think. I think so. I mean, that's kind of the official kickoff. Um, you know, we don't really do a lot of combine coverage out here. Uh, we're just not into it that much. Uh, Grump, you know, you are our resident draft guru. You do, a, you know. You do the Lord's work and all your research and analysis on, on, you know, prospects and film and going to the senior bowl with the talking giants crew. But, uh, you're not a big, um, combine guy. Well, I certainly don't watch it. And I, I think that if you are not a paid NFL, like in any way, football employee, it's not worth your time to watch it live. I mean, anything that happens at the combine that's otherworldly is a short clip that you can find later. Um, so anybody who watches it live that is not being paid to do so, I think is is wasting their time. There's not all, just, just not a lot, I think, that happens. A lot of this is proving what we already know to be true. Uh, and that's kind of the way I see it. Like the most valuable thing I usually pull from the combine is just the measurements. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, that's really where we separate fact from fiction with these guys. And it's kind of the only time that we separate fact from fiction. I mean, there's not a whole lot of the guys who change the conversation on who they are at the combine either came from a small school or buried on a depth chart where there is not a lot of film or they're a guy who studied for the test. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying the test is not the combine. The test is the game. 
So that's why I usually, I just watch the film room. Like a lot of guys will become workout warriors. They'll, they'll blow your mind with some kind of numbers. And obviously I'm speaking in generalities here. Like we can point to one specific player, do one specific thing in a year. And it went on to show. And I, I think that every year that there's some of that, but for the most part, what we're seeing is just, um, what we already know to be true quantified. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't really see any value in watching it live. And I see a lot less value in the results from that than I do in game situations and like the senior bowl practice and the East West shrine game and things like that. So you're not worried necessarily if you're watching a wide receiver or a tight end and you know, they do that thing where they're running around the, the, uh, the cones and make the quick catch. And if they drop two out of five row, you know, uh, rotations, you're not all of a sudden, oh, this guy's now a fourth round pick or I'm not as high as him as I was, correct? You're you're looking much more the total body of work and what they're doing. Right, right. Yeah. Anybody who has a knee-jerk reaction to the combine is probably selling themselves short. Like if I were to see a guy that I've already done all my film work on um, and he's checked all the boxes, he's a first round pick for me and I see him drop two out of four, I'll rewatch his game film and see if I see any bobbling of the ball or anything like that. Or if I can just chalk it up to he bobbled two out of four, and that's mm -hmm. rare for him. Um, if it's a guy I don't know, I'll certainly jot it down. And then when I watch his game film, I'll again check for it. Again, like these are just silly. Yes. They're kind of, they're kind of but, but, but again, like like I said, like – Right. So this is this is clarifying what we already know. Again, if, if a guy who has had trouble holding on to the ball bobbles in the combine, I know that this is not something he has worked out of. It had nothing to do with the quarterback that was throwing to him. This is a hands issue for this guy, and he hasn't improved on it. That's the kind of thing that I would be looking at. Again, just kind of verifying what we already know through film. Um, one guy I did talk about really briefly, I know he's probably has next to no impact with the Giants, but we got to bring him up because obviously I've been bringing him up and he's probably the biggest story in this combine. My man, AR Anthony Richardson. Um, let's forget about for a minute what he, you know, forget for a side what, what he did this past year of Florida, you know, people coming in who may not have watched as many Florida games as Grump and I did, or I did for sure. You know, they see the raw numbers. You know, the completion percentage was eh. They saw the terrible, terrible games against Kentucky and the first half against Vanderbilt. And they're like, why is this guy being considered for the first round, much less all of a sudden he's potentially going to be a top five, to potentially the number one overall pick. What does the combine do to kind of validate that in everybody's eyes and make everybody so excited? And does it have the same effect for you, what you see for someone like him? I think it's really difficult for a guy like him to overcome. I mean, if we're going to talk about him specifically, yeah. Um, I mean, like one of the things working against him is that he didn't just have an up and down year last year. That's kind of the only year he had. So mm -hmm. what he has is a lack of experience. And so the only film we have is super duper inconsistent. Um, but of course there are flash plays that absolutely bring your jaw to the floor and there's other things that are just traits, right? Like, I mean, it's not going to bring my jaw to, a f to the floor to see a guy throw 70 yards downfield. But it, I mean, it will at the college level. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, that's, that's not normal. I've been watching college football for, you know, 35 years. And I have never seen a quarterback as up and down as Anthony Richardson was this year. Where in that Kentucky game, he couldn't throw... Oh, you know, from boy, me yeah. to you, a pass. That was and bad then game. In the, and then in the Tennessee game, he looked like an NFL quarterback playing against an elite team. Um, you know, putting my giant hat on for a second, do I want him at the Giants to draft him? Let's forget Daniel Jones for a minute. And we have the, the potential to draft him. My answer would probably be no. Putting my Gator back, hat back on, I absolutely want him to come back because I think the leap he will make from – year one to year two as a starting college quarterback will be night and day. Um, I think he is a, an incredible, incredible talent, but an incredible, incredible risk in the NFL. And unless you have the absolute right coaching staff, who's willing to build an offense specifically around you, like what Baltimore's done with Lamar Jackson, I am very dubious about his success and 
you know, risking a a franchise level draft pick on the guy. Well, you nailed it. I mean, for what he can do to help himself, I mean, there's nothing I think he can do at the combine besides interview well um, to show what's going on between the ears with him. And that's a huge question. And it's it's not an insult to him. It's it's quite literally a lack of experience, a change of offensive schemes, you know, and, and that's kind of a lot of it right there. I mean, he may be a dullard. We don't know that. Uh, but there's no way to tell because the situation he's in is rough. Um, there's not much he can do with that. But what he can do with the combine is if he throws well, he can at least ease the questions about his accuracy and, you know, anticipation, you know, just in general, throwing the ball to the right guy, you know, just, uh, understanding route concepts, getting the proper Absolutely. depth, you know, all of these things. If he can erase the throwing the ball questions or at least uh, lower the volume on those questions, mm-hmm. then that will have helped him. Um, yeah. I honestly think if Dan Mullen would have stayed another year, he would have been a lot more successful in the Dan Mullen offense than he was in the um, – you know, in the Billy Napier offense this past year, I mean, this was a lot more, which again, you know, the, the Gator offense is supposed to be sort of a imitation of what the 49ers want to do. They don't have the personnel that the 49ers do, but that's what they're trying to do. And that may not be the right offense for him, but more, you know, let the quarterback do his thing under, you know, Dan Mullen. I think he would have been a lot more successful. Now, would that translate over to the NFL? You know, for Alex Smith, who was a Dan Mullen quarterback way back in the day, he had a pretty successful career in the NFL. You know, number one overall draft pick also. Tim Tebow, eh, not so much, although he may not have given the proper chance to. So I'm thinking, again, this really probably has nothing to do with the Giants at all. But I think, you know, if you're watching the combine and you have to watch somebody, you know, you, you will see a physical specimen and you'll be like, holy Jesus. The question will be how consistent will he be playing in a real game on Sundays? So um, I do kind of want to wrap the Anthony Richardson conversation, but it's it's fun to talk yeah. about because he's an, a really interesting guy, and I don't find the conversation like annoying or frustrating or anything like that. It's just not too relevant for the Giants. I guess. Yeah, it's like, not that relevant. But, 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 yeah. but there are some things there. Like So what you said, if Dan Mullen had stayed, he'd have been a lot more successful. I think if Dan Mullen had stayed at Florida, and this is just my opinion outside looking in, so you, you might actually be able to overrule me on this, but I think a lot of the questions about Anthony Richardson would remain. They would just be a lot more sane. Uh, I think there would be a lot more of, I don't want to say like casuals because I'm an amateur myself, but I think a lot more of the amateur draft people would be less – they would be more intrigued by him, I think, if he stayed. But the questions still remain because I think a lot of it had to do with inexperience. And Dan Mullen was never going to start him last year over Emory Jones. And he probably I th- wouldn't have started. Yeah, he probably wouldn't have, if if Dan Mullen would have stayed, Emory probably wouldn't have transferred to Arizona State, and Emory probably would have started this year. There hmm. might have been, you know, twenty five thousand Gators at Dan Mullen's door, ready to burn the house down, saying, "Why is Anthony Richardson starting?" But that hmm. probably the way Dan Mullen thinks. He probably wouldn't have started this past year, Anthony Richardson. So if Dan Mullen would have stayed this past year and Anthony Richardson played, started, I think we would be having a lot more of the conversation of is the third quarterback in this conversation this year Will Levis or is it Anthony Richardson? Because I do think those questions would remain in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. They would be a lot less maniacal. I think if Dan Mullen had a head on his shoulders and played Anthony Richardson two years ago – I think we would be having a much different conversation about him. I think that a lot of the nasty lowlights that you can find of him, and there are plenty, I think most of those don't even happen this year. I think those are sophomore highlights for him. And I think that our conversation is that he is ahead of Livy's for sure, and we're now having this conversation along with Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud. That's what I think. I think you agree with me. Ultimately, One, it didn't happen. One thousand percent. If he would have started Anthony Richardson in the middle of his sophomore year, not throwing him to the the wolves in the Georgia game when he was clearly unprepared, but you know a decision would have been made in mid October. You're starting the rest of the way, and he would have fired Todd Grantham, his awful defensive coordinator. 
Dan Mullen probably still be the court, the head coach at the University of Florida. He didn't do either of those things. He is now a piece of shit uh, analyst on ESPN 13. So fuck him. But yeah, I think he. Getting back to Richardson, I think those growing pains would have happened earlier on. You just saw that jump from year one to year two. You would have probably 18, 19 games of tape as opposed to 12, 11. That's a big, big difference. Another offseason to work with the ones, which he didn't have. All that would have been so much more for his development. Agreed. And um, there was something else I was going to say about him, too. Oh, yeah. Last note on Anthony Richardson. Um, Enough comparing to Josh Allen. Just stop. I admit, and I am not ashamed to say that I was super wrong about Josh Allen coming out of the draft. But also, the reason I'm comfortable saying that is because that shit just doesn't happen. What he did, he was the most inaccurate, couldn't hit the side of a building quarterback I had seen, big arm or otherwise, and they turned that around. I am not... I don't give a shit if Brian Dable is the coach of this person or not going to expect quarterbacks with piss poor accuracy numbers to, well, it happened with Josh Allen. It could happen. Yeah, it could happen. They could be Tom Brady too. Yes. Every quarterback drafted after day one could be Brock Purdy. That was like the night after uh, Kobe, Kobe Bryant had 81 points for the Lakers one night. And then he played two nights later and ESPN's like, will he do it again? (laughs) <laughs> well, it happened like three times ever in history, and it happened to this guy Tuesday night. What are the odds of it happening again are tiny, 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 like it's not going to happen. Um, yeah, so I mean like, yes, yeah, it so, could happen. I will never ever – don't ever just say like, well, it happened with Josh. Don't, don't do that. If you can only name one person that it happened with, it's not worth talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I don't, and I don't think necessarily Anthony Richardson is inaccurate. I just think he was wildly inconsistent. You know, and I think that is, that is a difference um, because it wasn't like good throw, bad throw, good throw, bad throw. It was good throw, good throw, good throw. Then all of a sudden, bad throw, bad throw, bad throw, bad throw, bad throw. That's a difference. Mm-hmm. And that's what he was this past year. Yeah. And and I don't know. There's a million things we can get into with like the offense and his skill set and whatever, but it's not worth it. I wish him luck. I just hope he's not in the NFC East or the NFC so I don't have to deal with him because if he is a stud, he can be a franchise changer, and I just hope he doesn't. I don't have to root against him like I had to root against Emmett Smith for all those years. So let's hope he goes AFC West. I don't have to deal with him hardly ever. Only in the Super Bowl, right? Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe he'll be a Raider. Hmm. Well, I mean, the Raiders have a history of drafting a quarterback with, you know. Huge upside potential, as they love to say. And Josh really McDaniels good. drafted Tim Tebow. Oh, I was also going back to what's his name, that fatso from LSU, uh, early part of the 2000s. Oh, J- uh, Jamarcus Russell? Jamarcus Russell, who didn't play much more than Anthony Richardson did that one year at LSU. So, All those times Mike Mayock said the greatest pro day I ever went to was Jamarcus Russell's really changes the way that sentence hits you once you've seen his Raiders tenure. (laughs) Mike Mayock's, I mean, not Jamarcus Russell's. Um, But yeah, uh, Josh McDaniel, coach of the Raiders, also drafted Tim Tebow when he was with the Broncos. So there's that. Tim Tebow won a playoff game, which a lot of quarterbacks who were destined to be franchise quarterbacks never did. Just to throw that in there. In any case, not our problem, um, but we're going to talk a little bit about defense today. So we talked about the DJ thing uh, last week. We talked about the Saquon Barkley thing last week, and we talked about the rest of the offense, which includes your Kenny Galladay conversations and your Nick Gates conversations and things like that. And I feel like all that is still pretty relevant. So if you have not listened to that episode from a week ago or watched on YouTube, go back and watch that. because Yeah, watch that and then watch really this right changed. after. Yeah, yeah. How about that? And and one thing we didn't really say about last week, um, let's let's start right here. I know it's February 27th for like a couple more minutes um, of 2023, but would you call today the New York Giants of 2023 season a Super Bowl contending team as of today? No. Okay. So if Daniel Jones takes up most of the cap this year with whatever he gets, 
Just understand that we are not a two million dollar man away from competing with for the Super Bowl. We are not. We are not winning the conference championship because we gave Daniel Jones a slightly smaller contract to afford somebody this year. Okay, just throwing that, that out there. That was just something we didn't say, and I'm pissed off that I didn't say it last night. It week. is That's so all. super important too, because I think a lot of Giant fans think, you know, we're all very excited. You know, we are relevant again. We are a, a legitimate playoff team again. Um, but we are still a rebuilding team. We still have a lot of holes to fill. And you can see that difference between us and the Phillies of the world. And it's not going to take one season to, to strengthen that gap. And nor does it need to be one season. I mean, the window of this team, I feel, is just opening. I mean, you think that a lot of these guys, the core of this team is pretty young. Uh, you know, we're talking about guys in the next year or so we have to think about after their rookie deal, the, the cornerstones of this team. So it's OK. And in 2024, 2025, there'll be a lot more cap money than there is even next year. So that gap between having to fill and having to pay won't be as a hard of a hit going forward because there'll be more money to spend. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that that transitions right into what we're going to talk about first, and that's the defensive line. So we're talking about we're going to have to deal with some of these young players getting paid. That is an important distinction. This is not an expensive team. I mean, a lot of the um, ball and chain to the finances are with the aging players that we're kind of shedding, right? We we know and Kenny Galladay for sure. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, but we're trying yeah. to we're trying to lose that shit anyway. This is a mostly young and hodgepodge team. Now, granted, we do have to pay a few young guys, namely four, right? Andrew Thomas, Daniel Jones, Dexter, Dexter Lawrence, Dexter Saquon Lawrence, Barkley. and Saquon Barkley. But that's only four. Well, would you consider Julian Love in that category? Well, we'll get to the D backs, but okay. But in any case, Dexter Lawrence is one of them. Um, he is yes. playing on his fifth year option this year. I believe it's something to the tune of twelve million. This is a possible extension here this year, maybe to lower the hit. You think, or do you think they work out a long term thing and he plays the whole year on the option? I think they're going to do everything they can to do it right now. I think so too. But do you think it's going to knock anything of substance off for this year? I think they're going to try to work it out. I think that yeah. I think we finally have a front office that doesn't look at every piece, not as individual pieces, but part of a master plan. I don't think Dave Gittleman at all thought about the overall chessboard and was just making moves to, we need this guy. We need this. I like this guy. I don't like this guy. Get rid of him type of thing where I think this is all part of a master plan and every move has impacts on other moves. Um, some of those moves we may not have liked in the beginning, but as you know, we get into year two and year three of the Joe Shane, Brian Dable era, it's all going to make more sense to what they're trying to do. So I think every move that they make will try to impact the short term as well as the long term. may not be as much as we they want to, but it'll be something. And we don't have to waste time talking about how good Dexter Lawrence is, right? We've talked enough we about him. Good. Yeah, he, he's he's one of the best players on this team. So right now, signed to the defensive line, Leonard Williams, Dexter Lawrence, DJ Davidson, last year's I think fifth round draft pick, got hurt this year. Uh, Ryder Anderson, and they just re-signed Vernon Butler to I believe a futures contract. Um, guys who are walking away from the team right now, uh, free agents, unrestricted, Nick Williams, Justin Ellis, Henry Mondu. Um, before we get to Leonard Williams, because I think that's going to be the other linchpin to this sure. conversation, anything, w- would you bring back any of those three free agents that are walking, Nick Williams, Justin Ellis, Henry Mondu? Justin Williams, if it's a super friendly deal, I don't think I'd spend any amount of money of any significance on him, but if we can get him back for, you know, kind of pennies on the dollar, maybe. I would say, so it's unfortunate for Nick Williams because he was playing well, and I think the rotation with two very good defensive linemen 
helped him statistically and and whatever product, right? Because mm-hmm. you have it's not like they're subbing out O linemen; they don't get a break. So That's constant correct. fresh legs hitting you when when they get to choose between Dexter Lawrence and then Leonard Williams. And Nick Williams just gets to eat the uh, the leftovers. Right. Um, but he did end the year on an injury. Um, so for me, yeah, Nick Williams is the only one I'm really considering here. Uh, but it might be like a vet minimum kind of thing only, which is That's what I'm absurd yeah, yeah. because he did play above that. He really did. But you might be able to get him on a one-year vet minimum because of the injury. I'm not sure. Well, I mean, remember also with that injury too, I mean, what is his appeal around the league also? He's not going to be commanding a lot from most others. so maybe I don't think so, no. So I think he just would be comfortable just staying, staying here. Yeah, I mean, he might be able to earn himself another contract, again, playing behind those two guys, right? Sure. Sure, and of course, you know, those two guys, you know, we're assuming – we're going to extend out Dexter Lawrence. Um, the next guy we're going to talk about, you know, may or may not even be here next year. Well, what do you think? Because for me, right now, Leo is on the books. But for $32 million with a $20 million cap, dead dead hit, which means he can be cut to save $12 million, which they do need room. I mentioned that at the beginning of the last episode. Um, next year is a void year for Leo, next year being 2024. The other piece of this puzzle, Leonard Williams is only 28. Would you potentially extend him and lower that hit? I would absolutely do that. I think that, you know, the Giants for the last 15 years have drafted defensive linemen, you know, defensive tackles only to see them go. And it's very hard to replace those guys. And, you know, I think he is a leader. I think that combination of him and and Dexter Lawrence, you know, I think will only be better once we get better linebackers on this team to help, you know, they can't do everything this defensive line uh, that will help with the run, you know, the the rushing defense, having better people behind them. I absolutely would. I think losing him is a huge gap that you're creating. And again, as we're still trying to rebuild this team, you know, that's a difficult position to, to fill defensive tackle. So I would, I would try to, uh, I would try to extend him. So me personally, he's got the void year next year and in 2024. And I don't really, I understand their purpose, but I don't know what their existence means for extensions. You know what I mean? I don't know what that entails, what we have to do to make whatever. I don't know, whatever you get my point. Mm -hmm. I would not extend him for much longer. Um, I do okay. think that we're – I mean I would extend him. I would try to see if we can work it out, but only for like an additional year. I don't want to keep him past 30. I think he's trying to hit another payday as well. Uh, so I don't know that how amenable he would be f- to a long extension. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like anything beyond just you know an extra year. So he's here for 2023 and 2024. Um, and I think – in general, I, I think we're trying to move away from well, the high price guys. I mean, if you're going to spend big money, it should be on guys who are getting, not getting younger, but not heading well, so close to 30. Let's talk about windows for a minute. Sure. Does he fit the window of this, what this current team is building towards? Or do you think that by the time this window is really open to win a Super Bowl, he fits in that plan? I think that it is possible for the Giants in two years, not next year, to make a surprising Super Bowl run, not unlike what the Bengals did. Correct. So I would say that he fits the tail end of the window only. Or or I guess the tail end of his tenure here might overlap the very beginning of a window. So no, I don't think so. I think he costs too much. Too so early. Using that kind of parameter, then it doesn't make sense to keep him. And the question is Yes and no. Yeah. Him, if you cut him right now, though, are we going to suffer a pullback right. that impedes that progress? Or maybe it doesn't. Maybe if the, the plan is still to keep getting draft picks and draft better, you know, this draft, next draft, maybe that in the long run is better for this team. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I don't think the front office wants to do that. I know the coaching staff and the players don't want to do that, but, you know, maybe that's in the best interest of this team. But I think if that window, if there is a little bit of that overlap, I think 
even if you're not quite there, I think you keep him because he's still damn good. And again, that that tandem with him and Dexter Lawrence is one of the better ones in this league. He played hurt for most of this year too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And playing like 98% of snaps towards yeah. the end there. Um, I, I agree with you. I, I think, look, even with that duo, we were a horrible run-stopping team last year. Yeah. And that's not all on them. That's been documented, whatever. But it's kind of a little bit on them. Sure, um, a little bit. And taking him away now, no matter what your offseason, I mean, you're not going to be drafting. They're not going to get the top defensive tackle. Okay, they're not getting him this year. He won't even last to their first round pick. Well, the hope is that for the beginning, in the middle, and the end of this window, we won't be able to get that top defensive tackle because. Right, we'll but, be but better. my point is, is that yeah. no matter what happens this off season, if they cut Leonard Williams, I don't see how they're better at stopping the run. I just don't, yeah. and that yeah. includes getting linebackers. That includes all that stuff. So for me, you transition away from Leonard Williams by. Drafting his replacement before he's ready to start, right? Like you keep Leonard Williams and draft his replacement for and let them overlap for a year, and you phase one out and phase one in. And it's what this team has been doing. Yeah, I mean, we lose somebody, a Steve Alford, uh, you know, one of these guys, and the next guy's right there, ready to go. So they they do think of succession plans. They haven't been spending a lot to keep these guys, but you know. That's what they're thinking, and I think that might be part of this plan as well. Um, let's slide out to the edges um, mm-hmm. because this is a quicker conversation, but I still think it's a combo. Right now, signed to the team, Kayvon Thibodeau, Aziz Ojolari, Taman Fox, Ellerson Smith. So two solid starters, if one can be healthy, and mm-hmm. two not-so-great depth. Free agents walking, Jihad Ward. O'Shane Ziminis. So it begs the question, do you offer anything to Ward or Ziminis, or do you look elsewhere for the rotation and depth? And or I guess you have to consider whatever the depth is, that third starter guy as A, part of the rotation, and B, able to handle the load in case one of those two is out for extended period of time, which Aziz has been. Am I crazy to think I may want to offer something to Ward? Dude, I think he's been great in this defense. I think he was outstanding against the run, and I think that, I mean, he is relentless in his pass rush, and even if he doesn't always get there, he helps other people get there. You just said something, too, that, you know, a big piece of this puzzle has already been solved. The fact that Wink Martindale is coming back, and because he's coming back, he's already had a year of, you know, analyzing and evaluating the status of this roster. So, you know, if a guy like Ward played well in this defense, he knows that maybe he has input into, you know, the front office to say, maybe bring this cat back for a little bit. So I would definitely extend something out to Jod Ward's camp. Mm-hmm. I just How think, uh, off the top of my head, I don't know. I can look it up while I'm talking, though. Um, my big concern is that we don't have a lot of money and he played well enough where I'm pretty sure we could be outbid for him, right? Well, making an attempt and actually keeping him are two different things. Sure. <laughs> I mean, that, that's just my concern, though. Probably. Yeah, he's, he's 28, so he's young. Um, yeah, I mean, I would I would extend something out to his camp, hope that he would like to stay, but um, I wouldn't be shocked if we're just outbid for him. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. I mean, we, as long as you try. Regardless, um, even if Ojolari had not had the availability questions, I still believe in a third rotational edge at least. I think Taman Fox is probably fine for that fourth guy. Ellerson mm-hmm. Smith is looking like a developmental piece that did not develop, um, which happens. Um, O'Shane Zimis, sir- are you going to offer anything in his direction? I am not. Yeah, me either. I'm done. <laughs> um, I think that this might be a spot where they might draft in the middle rounds or something. Or I mean, they might shock everybody and draft. Would it be obscene to draft day one or day two here? I think day one would be borderline obscene. Day two, I could see as a possibility. Um, day one would surprise me. Day one would surprise me, but and I'm I'm just imagining a first round pick edge guy 
mixed in with Tibbs, Ojolari, Leonard Williams, and Dexter Lawrence. That's pretty wild. I, that is very wild, and I think if we didn't have such a glaring need at places like wide receiver, sure, yeah, I think it would be like, oh, that's exciting. But yeah. I think, you know, this fan base. I mean, again, you know, you're hearing the common mantra, and you've heard it since like week four of this past season: is we need a wide receiver. We need a wide receiver <laughs> badly. We really need a wide receiver. And if someone's on the board that you know fits the bill, and we go, you know. Defensive end, people are going to freak. Doesn't mean it's the wrong decision, but it's not going to be a very, very popular one. Sure. I do think, though, I mean, when I look at this grouping, I see I see weakness, um, right? Like, mm-hmm. Ojolari, to me, I'm not counting on, on a – I mean, any snap, even if he's fully healthy, nothing all off season, week one, every time he lines up i'm not sure if he's going to get up off the ground and play and that might sound like hyperbole but that concern comes from there's no one behind him there's no one at all yeah and this is a dude who was a second round pick so you don't have a fifth round option for fifth year option and he's right. heading into year 3 anyway so if he right. has availability problems in year 3 now i'm starting to look at this as he's not really the future for this team at best he's depth for this goes team. back to windows so yeah. exactly which which then moves edge way to the forefront of needs because it means mm-hmm. we don't have a number two edge and Kayvon, as much as we like him and even though he's a top five pick was not von miller coming out of school so it's not as if we're just trying to find someone to bookend miles garrett or whatever over there we need somebody with some oomph you know yeah. which he has ojalari but when he brings it right uh so I think that would be a daring move, but a, not a stupid one to go day one, day two with Edge. Just throwing be, that out there. It'd be interesting to see. Again, draft is about guys, not places. That's so, true. Yeah. That'd be interesting to see kind of like the influence that Wink has with the front office too. If he can make his case that, you know, hey, you know, we bring another Edge guy in or something. We really need this for this defense, you know, and – just be an interesting thing to see. Yeah. One of the common um, scapegoats for the defense's <laughs> issues was the linebacking group. Um, and I, I, my my main question here is how badly does this need to does does this group need to be upgraded? Right. Mike and McFadden, Darian Beavers, Tay Crowder, Carter Coughlin, Cam Brown. And uh, those guys are signed, and Jalen Smith is a free agent, and I believe so is um, the Florida kid that we took from Detroit. Oh, uh, Davis. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Not good. Not good, Bob. Not Not good, good. Bob. Great show. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, I mean, there's there's no uh, ifs, ands, or buts about it. They need to address this in the offseason. They don't have a lot of money, and I don't think that buying linebackers usually works i I just don't see that i think this is a draft thing i think this is going to be this is where you pay your scouts is finding like an impact linebacker that won't cost much on draft day i also think that this could be the bigger surprise on day one than uh defensive end yeah yeah because i i think you know defensive end we're worried about depth and everything but linebacker is a you know it's my number two need on this team besides wide receiver, uh, you know, from the reasons we said before that, you know, one of the one of the main reasons why the run game, the run defense was so bad because the linebackers sucked. You know, defensive line can't do everything, um, you know, out in coverage, you know, not good. So <laughs> I'm being being polite. Yeah, very. <laughs> so <laughs> um, it, to me, it's, it's just a monster, monster need. And if that guy they want is there. You know, and there's a wide receiver that's there. I would not be surprised if they went with that linebacker. Um, would you extend anything to either free agent linebacker, Jalen Smith or Davis? No. Really, neither? Neither. Oh, okay. <laughs> you neither, neither me. Um, neither, neither. <laughs> I'd, probably, I'd probably extend something to Jared Davis, uh, but minimal. Um, and partly is because... Beavers is coming off an ACL, and I didn't love him anyway. McFadden was fine. Tay Crowder was benched, and Carter Coughlin and Cam Brown, those guys are special teams players. I'd get him just for the depth. Yeah, yeah, if you're saying the vet minimum, yeah, maybe. I mean, how much is that? 
It's like uh, I think like around a million, just under. Um, I think it's like eight hundred fifty k or something. Possibly, possibly. Yeah, I'm not extending shit to Jalen Smith though. No, no, um, no, no. This is the big one, corner. Um, signed to the team right now. This is important. Dory Jackson, Nick McLeod, Cordell Flott, Rodarius Williams, Fabian Moreau. He is the free agent. Ooh, um, the questions come in, right? Dory Jackson, do you cut him? Do you extend him? Do you do something to his cap number? Um, and cornerback two, what do you do? Do you reach out to Fabian Moreau? Do you look elsewhere? Do you draft? What? What's What's Cordell Flott to you? What is Nick McLeod to you? Speak, Cranky Van. Dory Jackson, we saw how important he was to this defense last year. He's 27 years old. I think you try to extend him and push his number out. I think he's that important. I know some. there's going to be some people who say we cut him. I think we keep him. I think he's, I think he's that important to this team. And t- until we can get, you know, t- until we know for sure what Cordell Flott is, until we either draft or we get another guy on the other side or something. I just think right now, again, same situation like with um, – uh, on the defensive line, if you get rid of him, you know what's replacing it, and we can have a serious drop off without him. And, and that's what I'm worried about. I don't want to, I don't want to go backwards during this rebuild. I want to keep going forward. So, what do you do about corner two if you're going to keep and and or extend Dory Jackson? What does corner two become for you? I know you are not a big fan of um, drafting corners. Is that correct? You more you are a draft wide receiver, get free agent corners. That's your that's your mantra. That's my mantra for fixing needs immediately. I do. N- yeah. I am not a fan of expecting rookie corners to be starters. That's what it is. I am not yeah. okay with drafting them. Just don't expect them to start or do I well starting. As, I guess I look at it as kind of like transitioning a little bit. I think I would. I would draft on the other side. You know, get another year or two out of Adori, and then hopefully that guy is ready to be your cornerback one along with flat along with maybe you know uh, a reasonably priced corner to also i just think that we're not ready yet to to jettison him and, and hope for the best and have any immediate impact from like a draft pick or something well i couldn't agree with you more on a lot of this uh dory jackson i am i am willing to extend that man we saw his value just like you said the moment he went down with a knee injury because of a punt return, we sucked, um, and it was a it was a brutal stretch of games. And we knew the cause; we knew it would happen, and it happened. And um, the biggest coaching mistake of the year. By look, it's okay staff. when you're right; you're right, and we were right that it would happen, and we were right that it would be a big deal. And now we know it's a big deal, and we know not to do that, and that's how we learned. Um, yeah. Adoree Jackson, I'm not making a move. I know how much he costs. I'll try and lower that by extending him if I can. If not, I'm extending him anyway because he's really good. Um, to me, I think you let Nick McLeod and you let Cordell Flott and you let Rodarius Williams, you let them compete for that second outside spot. I think you also extend something minimal out to Fabian Moreau. He certainly earned mm-hmm. it. I agree. Um, and I would even say you can if you have made the requisite moves – um, you know, your bigger priority things, right? You've signed DJ. Maybe you've signed Saquon Barkley. Maybe you haven't, but you made your decision on it already. Yeah, I was going to get to this. Just keep going. But I'm just saying, like, you do this, this stuff. Yeah. You've cut Kenny Galladay. Um, you got your money back from that. Maybe, maybe you've extended Leonard Williams and you've got a little bit of extra money to play with. If you've got that extra money, I say reach out to somebody like Cam Sutton corner for Pittsburgh, former Tennessee volunteer, somebody I did draft work on years back. I liked a lot. I think he's played okay. And, you know, my big issue, the the problem with this is it's a shitty free agent class no matter what position you're looking at. It's just a shitty group of free agents this year. Just is. So while his market value may be something like $8 million, I have no idea what he'll actually command from a team with money that wants Mm -hmm. a corner. So he may be just completely out of the price range, but I'm at least exploring that option. At the end of the day, 
getting a guy like Cam Sutton or re-signing Fabian Moreau, those are stopgap solutions to get a starter for a year, two years, three years at most. If you want to, they're going to keep building this team through the draft. So they're going to draft a corner anyway, I'm pretty sure. My ju- my big thing is that the sauce gardeners of the world are the same thing as the Josh Allens of the world, improving their accuracy numbers at the NFL level when there's no evidence to suggest that would ever happen. Being a all-pro corner in your first year is virtually unheard of. Sure. So don't ever like- expect, I don't care if they're drafted first overall, don't expect corners to be good starters year one. Just don't. Right now. And that was my point I was about to say is, where was he drafted? I mean, we're not even drafting anywhere near where he was. So even for someone that was drafted in the top three or top five to be an all pro is phenomenal. To expect it, you know, 25th pick or whatever we're drafting or in the second round, it makes it exponentially more difficult. So, Look, I don't have the numbers, um, but you just have to delve into your memory. The, the first round corners that immediately get thrown into starting positions – they're not like like Jeff Okuda. What's he doing these days? He's a bust for Detroit. I mean, like the well, list. Look at who we drafted in the last ten years. I mean, where are any of these? Guys? DeAndre Baker. Yeah. I mean, like I just think that the Eli Apple's a meme at this point. Yeah, true. But at least he's a starter on a playoff competitive team. But that's not really my point. My point is, I think that if you were. I, I think there's a ton of misses with first round corners. And I don't necessarily think it's a skill or player thing. I think it may be a confidence thing of guys being thrown into starting positions immediately and losing a lot and losing that mojo that they have that makes them good. I do think that there's something to that. But regardless, I would rather draft corners round two, round three, round four, grow them behind people and let them earn spots. I don't like drafting them with the first round draft pick. It's got, but again, the draft is guys, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. That's kind of the way I look at the corner spot. Uh, I've grown to agree with that of hearing your nuanced explanation over the years, and I've I've come to agree with you. I mean, I'm I'm. It's how I feel. So I'm willing to change that if I see more evidence. But at least recently, it feels that way about first round corners. I just don't mm-hmm. love it. Mm-hmm. Um. But Wink Martindale is is a big fan of DBs. He had a big thing about getting corners on DoorDash or whatever. We go to the safety position. McKinney, Pinnock, Belton. Uh, you know, I, I I'm gonna loop in the the slot corners in here just because I just think they're general DBs. They might have a safety ish role. But you know, so you have Aaron Robinson, Darnay Holmes, and then guys like Zion Gilbert and and whatever, right? Trent Thompson, Burgess. Mm-hmm. Those guys are all signed. The the unrestricted free agents, Landon Collins, I believe, right? Yes. Um, Julian Love and Tony Jefferson. Right now, I would say this is a pretty good group of safeties we have with McKinney, Pennock, Belton. That's that's three starters right there. Even if mm-hmm. Pennock isn't great, um, even if He's Belton an NFL isn't starter. great, yeah. Um, do we so- need a box safety A and B? How much do you value Julian Love? Well, I mean, when you put it in the context of who else we still have, I don't value maybe as much as I, you know, some of the other guys we'd mentioned as guys we need to kind of keep. Um, I think if we had more money, he would certainly be a higher priority. But maybe because what we have coming, you know, we still have. Maybe if I have to make a, a hard choice, I think he might be the one that goes of all the other, you know, hard decisions we're going to have to make. You know, all of these things we're talking about, Grump, you know, these we have lots of decisions to make. This all seems to me going back to what are we going to do with Saquon Barkley? I think that's the money piece of all this because Julian Love is someone, again, I would love to still have on this team, no pun intended. I, but somewhere we're going to run out of money. And I just think that a guy like Saquon Barkley to me is a luxury at this point more than a, you know – at the sacrifice of other foundational pieces that I think we need for this team to be successful. I I, I think that's a fair opinion. Um, I do think that we need a – first of all, this is a Wink Martindale defense. I think 
you just get as many DBs as possible. I don't think you can yes. have enough DBs. And I think, honestly, if Wink had his way, he would have, like, three 350-pound defensive linemen and then <laughs> just, like, eight DBs running all over the field. Yeah, people. what do you call something that's more than a <laughs> beyond a dime? Like yeah. a, a, a Benjamin defense? Yeah, I don't really. know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you see that with Tony Jefferson getting snaps in as a box safety. You see that with converting Landon Collins to linebacker. Mm-hmm. And Julian Love is very good at that position as well. I think it's very, very important. Um, I also think that Wink, as much as he says stuff about getting D-backs on DoorDash, I think he's really good at taking D-backs off the scrap heap and making them functional. Especially mm-hmm. in this role, that's super, super duper confined to like a box safety role. I think you can get somebody for cheaper than what Julian Love offers. But Julian Love is a team first, high character, captain kind of guy who's got the intellect. He's not often out of position. But I mean, that comes at the drawback of he's not the most athletically gifted guy we have in the secondary. So I, as much as I would love to have him back for a lot of reasons, I'm kind of okay if he walks. I can get on with it. Um, okay. But, but I mean, I do have a lot of value there, and I, I respect your your Barkley take, and I do think that if Barkley is not re-signed and we have that money kind of floating out there, Julian Love is, I don't know, probably the second guy I'm willing to use that money on mm-hmm. in that scenario, assuming you know we're not talking about DJ. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. And I also think that, we didn't get to – I know I know we're hyping – I'm always hyping this guy up. But we didn't really get to see Wink Martindale utilize Aaron Robinson that I think is so good in that downhill def- – like just – he's like made for Wink's defense. If you look at his film, he the, when he triggers to go downhill and hit somebody, man, it's like you just – told him that there's free chocolate or or something like you can see that spark in his eyes he's ready to fuck somebody up and i i think that fans didn't get to see that wink didn't even get to see what he's got there right so Mm -hmm. i think that there might be some um maybe some gemstones hidden among the uh rubble (laughs) gotcha (laughs) Um, that was that was nice. I might put that uh put my gemstones book, my, among the rubble. Put that in my quote book. Sounds Should like I a, pulled out of my ass while talking. If Aerosmith had another album come out, that sounds like a title of it. Well, album. I just scrapped it. There it goes. <laughs> Not a big Aerosmith guy. Sorry. Oh well. <laughs> Respect their ability to completely change their music through decades, though. Um, I've got nothing else, right? That we've pretty much covered the team. I think that's pretty much you know over the last few episodes we've kind of done our little state of the state of the roster state of the important state of what we would do state of what's feasible look now the the question becomes how do we improve on it what do we do and like i said the combine ending is kind of the start of our draft coverage so if you kind of enjoyed that anthony richardson conversation that's a lot of what the draft kind of stuff is that was kind of general so we kind of like had him in the I guess the parameters of talking about the combine at first, but then we kind of went more into him as a person. It gets way more in depth than that, but that's a nice little taste of how we kind of talk about, you know, we highlight guys and we break it down by position. So next week will be quarterbacks, right? Quarterbacks. Let's get started. Yeah. Yeah, Let's jump right into it. So until then, please follow us on Twitter. I am at football underscore grump. He is at the cranky fan. I will be doing tons of draft stuff beyond the scope of just this podcast. It it completely dominates my Twitter feed. So um, if the draft is something that's interesting to you and all the possibilities and the wonders of the world out there, I might be a good follow for you. This is is grump's time to shine i mean you know he's fantastic obviously during during the season but this is where he's made his bones and this is where you know he's burning the midnight oil he is you know you can watch whatever you want on you know mainstream football shows and stuff but damn it this guy's got something he knows his shit so i highly recommend you know follow his twitter feed follow this this feed follow I'm sure he'll be making other appearances, like on Talking Giants and stuff with you know, with those guys and everything. But uh, an absolute follow, and 
if you want to hear about everything else other than the draft, follow me at the Cranky Fan. I got a lot of things to say. Well, shit, about man. I everything mean, going on. <laughs> not everyone is a big off-season person because a lot of people are baseball people, and that is some pitchers and catchers started. Spring training is underway. You are. Um, Pit, I'm a pitch clock guy. I don't know how you guys are out there. I'm a pitch I, clock guy. Fuck I baseball. love. I, you know something? It is the greatest thing because you know. The, the early returns. I know it's the beginning of spring training, but when you have games are going on for two hours and twenty minutes and two thirty, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. If you watch every night, like I'm sure a lot of you people who listen to this show are Yankees fans. Do the fans math or on fans. how much time you spend in one summer watching baseball. It yeah. is an obscene amount of hours. And think about the time that – of all that time you're watching baseball to how much game action you're actually watching. That percentage is so low. This is going to tighten the game up, make everything so much faster. I love it. It's okay. Sports evolve. This isn't 1913. You know, Games evolve. Rules evolve. Things change. And they are meant to make these games more entertainment and more enjoyable. So I am all for it. I, the rules have, have changed for the NBA and the NFL and for hockey for the majority have made these sports better. They're more fun. So don't be old man, yell, you know, waving at the clouds. Understand why they're doing things and just accept them because you'll find you're your, your viewing – uh, your entertainment will be much greater. I'm already happier. Look, if I can't be entertained by a three-hour fucking movie, why would I be entertained by three hours of baseball? <laughs> Let's be serious, man. Movies are too long, too. It's not maybe there should baseball. Maybe there should have been a pitch clock in The Departed, maybe. The scene clock. <laughs> the scene <laughs> clock. Get in and get out. <laughs> all right, everyone. We will see you all next time. iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Play, and YouTube. We will see you next week for Quarterback Talk. Until then, go Giants. Go Giants. <laughs>